Hey friends, I'm Greg Nettle, and this is the Church Planting Podcast. I serve as president of Stadia Church Planting, where we believe that every person on the planet, every person deserves access to a thriving, growing, multiplying church. On the Church Planting Podcast today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Wes Stafford. Wes is a personal friend and a mentor of mine for a lot of years. Dr. Wes Stafford is going to be talking with us about pouring into the next generation. And that's very apropos for Wes, because Wes is the one who started the phenomenal growth of Compassion International around the world. Wes is going to talk with us about how to mentor other leaders, how to grow your team, the importance of living a lifestyle that can be emulated by others. Let's welcome and join in the conversation with Dr. Wes Stafford. Wes, welcome to the Church Planning Podcast. Thank you, Greg. I'm glad to be a part of it. And Wes, you you have this huge legacy of ministry now, um, Compassion International. And Jimmy Mayato is the current president and a good friend of mine personally and friend of Stadia. But my goodness, when I look at Compassion's history, I know you... You stood on the shoulders of the first president and you passed it on to Jimmy. But when I look at the growth of Compassion International during your ministry there and your presidency, it's just astonishing. Talk to us a little bit, kind of where was Compassion when you started? Where was it when you finished? Well, you know, every uh, every leader of an organization kind of has their watch. They have their chapter. And I inherited from my predecessor, Wally Erickson, a remarkable foundation upon which to build. So uh, much of the growth of Compassion came under my leadership. And I, uh, seven years ago, was able to pass it on to Jim and Miata, who was taking it uh, to either greater depths and greater heights. Uh, so I had, a, I had a front row seat of watching uh, what God can do with an organization that is completely committed to him. I joined it almost 45 years ago. It was a little storefront operation in uh, Chicago. And this was back in 1977. It was a 25-year-old ministry, uh, but it had managed to grow to 25,000 sponsored children. That sounds like a whole lot, uh, but that was 25 years of our founders' uh, efforts. Uh, when I joined it, uh, I didn't join it because it was big, and I didn't join it because it was great. I joined it because I could see the seeds of greatness in it. It matched my heart. It matched my sense of what needs to be done in the world. And uh, the minute I saw what it was all about, I threw my hat in the ring and said, I'm going to, I'm just going to give this thing everything that I've got. So for 45 years, I've watched it grow from uh, the 25,000 sponsors we had at the beginning uh, to 2.2 million sponsors uh, today. We had a staff back then of about 30 people, and now it's about 3,500 people, plus about another 65,000 people who are actually implementing the program in uh, 8,600 churches. I watched the budget, uh, Greg, grow from uh, $5 million, which was like enormous. Of course, startup organizations, it takes a while to get going. Uh, but today, even in the midst of the pandemic, uh, Compassion passed a really important milestone, the billion-dollar uh, budget. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I've, had a, I've had a front row seat watching this. From my perspective, it's a perfect example of his strength made perfect in our weakness. I, I, I just, there's so much I want to unpack with you and talk with you about because you've been and are such an important part of my life personally and of Stadia, the organization that God's entrusted me to lead for this mm -hmm. chapter of its ministry. And yeah. I, I was just thinking when you said when you started, Wes, um, uh, 25,000 children were sponsored. And I, I, I don't know if you know this, but Jimmy Mayato just called me recently to tell me that through the Stadia partnership, we've now helped sponsor 50, 000, more than 50,000 children just in that <laughs> partnership alone. But the reason I'm even bringing that up is because I can't wait till the day when we say in Stadia is now at the 2 million child mark that we've helped you know, sponsor in partnership with Compassion International. And just your legacy encourages me to go, we, yeah, that's, you know, that's the next chapter. We're going to, we're going to keep moving in that direction. And you know, Greg, 
those sponsors, 50,000 sponsors that you guys have touched are the most blessed of our children because they are in churches that have been planted specifically uh, to minister to children. So those children, the future of them, surely there will be many, many, many more of them, but the future of those children, how they bless their communities and nations, uh, that's about as strategically important as we got. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, Wes. Okay, let's talk about how kind of you and I got started together, because we're going to talk today about pouring yourself as a leader into other leaders, and mentoring, li you know, lifting up other leaders around you and developing them. And you have done that so well. And it was funny when I asked you about this to prepare for the podcast, I said, well, I don't know if I do that very well. And I'm thinking, you do it better than anyone I've ever met. And I appreciate your humility, but I, I was a, a much younger leader when you and I met, and it was crazy. I read your book, Too Small to Ignore, which if you haven't read that, that is just a must, must read for every leader, regardless of any industry you're in, church leader or business leadership, Too Small to Ignore by Wes Stafford. And God used that book to just wreck my heart. And you graciously agreed to meet with me. I flew out to Colorado and, uh, you, you know, your, your executive assistant said, well, what, do, what does Greg want to meet with, with him about, right? And, and I didn't know. I just knew God had told me to fly out and meet with you. And you were so gracious to meet with me because I knew your busy schedule. We spent two hours together and that started a friendship and a time when I would come down once a month, fly out to Colorado Springs, spend the day with you, and then several trips around the world with you. Um, yeah. and uh, in a kind of a mentoring relationship. Wes, why did you say yes to Greg Nettle all those yeah, years? Yeah, well, that, that was while I was president in, in the midst of a great flurry of stuff. And my days were pretty much carved into 15 minute increments. And uh, so in comes this pastor from Ohio and uh, my assistant says, you do not have time for this today. But I had this overwhelming sense of this is a divine appointment. I think we better. And it didn't take us 50, certainly didn't take us 15 minutes to discover a meeting of our hearts and a passion of it all. Greg, you know, when I wrote Too Small to Ignore, the cry of my heart uh, was that pastors would read this and catch the vision for how incredibly strategically important ministry to children were. And when uh, when I uh, when I met you and saw that you had read that book and it had had an impact, it made all of the effort of writing that book uh, come come to life. And I immediately sensed uh, this is precious, and we must uh, we must get to know each other. And uh, so we, yeah, we we did two hours that day with a commitment. After that, let's keep together. Let's so let's grow together. Let me teach you what I know about this. Uh, let's. Uh, let's walk together in this had no idea uh this was ultimately going to lead to stadia and a strategic partnership with compassion i mean god was all over that and uh yeah you might say well you you did a really great thing wes uh truth be known it isn't giving that you receive well and, and there's the principle of pouring into others right and you know it's yeah. really fun for me because i i wouldn't let compassion come into river tree where i was senior pastor prior to that meeting <laughs> and now today, River Tree sponsored more than four or five thousand children with compassion. Um, you, it led my relationship with you led to my wife and I becoming foster parents. It led us to adopt our son um, Elijah from the foster care system. So God has used you to literally transform my heart and my life in in profound ways, Wes. And I'll be forever grateful. Let's talk specifically about when you were pouring into me, and I know you did this with this was kind of normative for you um you know the specifics one of the things i valued so much was your authenticity with me and so could you talk a little bit about that as we pour into other leaders uh yeah let me give that a thought um you know there is uh if you lack integrity if you lack credibility you lack pretty much everything and one of the hard things about leadership is you often are isolated you're surrounded by staff. You're, it's like being in a chain link fence in which you don't allow many people to wander and the gate is locked so you don't get out all that much. And when you discover someone, and this was a thing that really moved my heart, Greg, was you, you had an incredible hunger. You had an incredible desire to learn. I knew that you were an avid reader and I had this overwhelming sense that this was uh, a, a really worthy investment. You know, uh, a lot of times mentorship uh, is pouring from one person into another. Uh, 
with the hope that uh, that something good will, will come from it. But there's no greater joy than pouring into someone that you know the content is not going to stop with them. You're not just filling up a bucket and building a, you know, a greater, greater reservoir of knowledge uh, for this person. But when you see that person, and this is what I saw in you, Greg, when you see that, that person is not a bucket, that person is a pipe. What you pour into them flows through them and out to other people. Well, the return on investment is twice as uh, strategic. And okay, so, that so you, you, you talk to me, though. That, I mean, let's talk about that. So you're making, when we mentor, we want to make sure that it's a worthy investment. That's fair. That it's a good use of our time, right? Uh, right. That the person's an avid learner, right? Are those, are, are those the things you're looking for? Clearly, and that those people either are on a journey for a life-changing cause, as you were, or they already have one. You know, I'm often asked, uh, will, you, will you mentor me, as you can imagine? And the first question I ask him is, uh, so why do you want to be a leader? And inevitably, I see a blank stare. Well, doesn't everyone? Isn't that the name of the game? Climb to the top of the heap? Uh, what, I, what I've learned in, uh, is... Uh, no, it, it, it really isn't. Leader, you should not go looking for leadership. I believe leadership should find you. And so I will often say to them, uh, well, um, what is it you want to lead? And often, again, I get a blank stare. Well, you know, I want to lead anything. It's, it's got to be the most fun, the, the highest prestige, the biggest office, the biggest salary. Uh, and uh, what I eventually say, well, then tell me this. What is it you really, really care about? And if I see, a, again, a blank stare, uh, I either will say, well, let me see if I can convince them that what I care about is strategically important. Or I tell them, listen, you go away, young man. You find why you want to be a leader. You think through what you want to lead. And when you have a cause that you can come and describe to me and you can't do it without tears of either sorrow or joy, uh, then we can talk about leadership. I'll tell you how to lead in the context of a cause. But if, I, if we were talking about how to run a bank, how to run a business, I don't have anything more to offer you than anyone else. So find your cause. If you don't have a cause that can move you to tears in 30 seconds, I maintain you're not fully alive. And it's probably, you have to be very careful as a leader, how many times you give yourself away, uh, because every time you say yes to something new, you probably have to say no to something else, or you're absolutely overwhelmed. So yes, I have mentored a good number of people, but not without first putting me through the grid. And what I saw in you was uh, a blank slate. You had been deeply moved with something you, as a very intelligent, very passionate pastor, had never given a great deal of thought to. And when you said, how could I have gotten this far and never fully understood the importance of children, I knew that this was someone I wanted to invest in. It still breaks my heart, Wes. It brings me to tears right now. Um, so, mm -hmm. the, the, so I want some nuts and bolts now because, you know, you've done it so well. Um, so I, this was fascinating to me as I reflect back, right, over all those uh, months where I would fly out to Colorado Springs, I was thinking, okay, in this mentorship, I flew and met with you. Um, you weren't flying out to Ohio, okay? That's important, okay, that mm. it was my effort there. You were giving me the time, but I had to make the effort. I would bring in my journal a list of questions. Um, so there were times when you were certainly speaking into my life all the time, and you may have something specifically for me or say, I want you to read this. Um, but I was also driving a lot of the conversation because I came prepared to say, this is what I would like to learn, Wes, from you. These are the questions I have. How important is when you're pouring into someone for the person you're mentoring to actually own that relationship um, for you as the mentor? It's, it's hugely, hugely important. And uh, if you're a young person looking to be mentored, you got to understand that the person that you're asking to mentor you uh, has a full slate and you had better make it worth their time and effort. And again, if, uh, if you know, many college professors don't worry about this, the idea of teaching is just pour a bunch of content into a bucket, watch them take 
copious notes, give them an exam here and there to see if anything actually stuck to the wall or not. And uh, that is simply not worth the time of a, of a, of a busy, engaged uh, leader. So one of the things you do early on is see how committed is this person? When you said to me, how about I fly out every few months? Would you give me like a half a day? Uh, I knew that you were dead serious. I knew behind you was a dynamic church that as I poured into you, you were going to pour into that church. And I knew that that would become a child focused church. And so, um, I didn't just give you, I mean, we talked about many, many topics, but I didn't just give you a whole bunch of topics, too, that we're, we're going to cover. We were starting where you were, the questions you had as an avid reader, as a dynamic leader. And uh, when I discovered in the first session that you were asking penetrating, uh, life-impacting questions, uh, I absolutely uh, loved it. And so I would really, as you remember, I would begin where you were. And uh, I would answer the question that you were grappling with, and then hopefully extend the conversation to little mini lectures of things that maybe you hadn't asked, but I knew you eventually would, um, that allowed us to do this more in the form of a conversation than a, uh, a pouring out of one person to the other. I got back from you uh, as much as I gave to you, and I didn't even know where all this was going. Okay, so so I appreciate all, all of that immensely. Um, now, as as time progressed and and we're spending time together, um, one of the things that w was really important in our relationship for me was you were accessible to me. I remember calling you one evening from my house. I was having some challenges with uh, our daughter Tabitha at the time, who, who I just performed her wedding yesterday, as you or Sunday, <laughs> as you know, uh, Wes. She's this wonderful, yep. amazing lady who loves children and sponsors children through compassion has helped plant church with stadia, you know, to, 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 to just crazy good. Um, I, remember, I remember she mobilized a whole bunch of her friends and actually planted a church with their own money. Seven, eight children in high school raised $87,000 to plant a church. And then their uh, home church sponsored all the kids. And that church I, is in Ecuador today. Just incredible. But I, I remember calling you on your cell phone one night at home, or it might have been on your home phone, and saying, "Wes, I need some advice." And 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 then you and I started. I made several trips with you to see the compassion work at different countries, and um, and there was, and then and then I, I even had dinner with you and you and Donna, your wife, in your yeah. home, which yeah. was so special. And 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 so there was this accessibility that you gave to me at, at some point. And so could you talk about the importance of that as you move in the mentoring relationship, the actual accessibility of relationship? Yeah. Well, you know, um, you earned that, uh, Greg. You don't, you, you don't open up your heart and your home, uh, you know, if you're mentoring 12 people and half of them are buckets, not pipes. <laughs> and so um, you... Uh, you, you draw close uh, to those that you can see. Uh, you know, Jesus had 12 disciples, but he had three that were the really inner circle. And you were clearly uh, an inner circle type person uh, to me. And when that comes, uh, well, suddenly you merge from mentor and mentee to, uh, to friends, and then eventually into brothers, and then eventually into co-workers, and then into champions of the cause that brought you together. And that's exactly the, the path that we had. We did that for, I think, close to three years, Greg. And then I remember finally saying to you one day, Greg, I think I have told you everything I know. <laughs> well, and that kind of broke my heart when, um, when we had that conversation, because I thought, oh, this relationship's over. And the reality was, that's not what you were saying to me. You were saying, it's entering this next phase, uh, phase now. We're we're now friends, and yep. we're going to be co-laborers and champions now together. But I didn't understand that at the time. But thank you for modeling that for me. And because it, what it meant was, I mattered more to you than just me being your mentee. Right, and I felt like uh, it was, I, you know, the bucket was full, and it was beginning to pass on. I knew you from watching you pastor that that would be the natural thing going on. Uh, and that for that point forward, 
we would have the same thing. We'd pick up the phone and call each other. We'd travel together. This, the relationship changed. It was not me pouring into you, but it was us pouring into each other. Ultimately, I think that is where you're, what you're aiming for uh, when you're mentoring uh, in the kingdom. Well, and there's so much, I think back to the time I did have uh, dinner with you and Dada at the house. And, you know, it's the proximity, right? It's not just pouring knowledge, but I'll never forget the conversation. You live out on a, a, a ranch in a very modest home, and and I, you had this tractor out there, and you, you looked at me and you said, someday I really hope I can get a, a, a nice tractor, uh, maybe a John Deere or something to mow and do some work out here on the on the ranch. And and I said, good heavens, Wes. I said, you've shared with me how much you you make, and which was ridiculously low, but I said, surely you can afford to to buy a tractor. And And Donna, your wife, looked at me, pointed her finger in my chest and she said she said greg we work with children in poverty we have enough and i was like holy cow and that started this whole new journey of mentoring on what does it mean to live with enough which yeah. came through donna your wife simply because we were in proximity that way wes so yeah. thank you. And, and then do you remember the time that you came to my house? Do you remember with Tabitha what you did with her upstairs do you remember, in, in, in her bedroom? I, this sounds awful. This is a good story. She was <laughs> studying American Indians. Do you remember this? She told me the whole study and showed me the th handcraft and things that she had made studying American Indians. And, you know, here I am an old man and here she is a young lady. But again, a, a meeting of hearts. And she was sweet enough to invite me up and show me her bedroom, and then her very, very special little part of her bedroom. And it was her tiny little, I think it was under the staircase, little cubby It was a little hole. attic cubby hole, Wes. Yeah. <laughs> and she was so sweet that, you know, I could barely get through the door of it, but she let me crawl inside. And there we sat, two friends, while she just shared her heart, what she was learning. We laughed, we giggled. Uh, it was, it was, and she won my heart forever. I was, I couldn't be there at her wedding this week, but boy, my heart sure was. Well, it was just, it's just fascinating. I was downstairs and I said to my wife, I said, Julie, where's Wes? And she said, I, I think he might've gone upstairs. And so I walked upstairs and there was your butt sticking out of the cubby hole <laughs> and you were crawling in there. And I walked down to Julie and, and Julie said, where is he? And I said, he is in the cubby hole with six-year-old Tabitha and looking at her Indian artifact collection. And you know, Wes, I, that, again, in mentoring with proximity, what's that teach Greg Nettle? It teaches me that I'm never too good to get down on my hands and knees and crawl into a space with a child and sit with them and giggle and learn from them and hopefully be a blessing to them. And that's what you did with our daughter. And that doesn't happen except in proximity as we pour our lives uh, into each other. I, you know, I, I tell I challenge men because every man I ever met once was a child. And yet, for some reason, we tend to forget what it was like to be a child and how it feels uh, to be near children when you are standing six feet tall and they're barely coming up to your belt buckle. Uh, you're intimidating by your very size. And I tell men, you never stand so tall as when you stoop to help a child. And so I urge them, uh, you know, kneel down every chance you get, get at their eye level so that you're on equal basis and just pour your heart, listen to them as much as you talk. And uh, yeah, that's what you call child discipleship. And so who poured into you, Wes? Who helped you with those leadership lessons? You know, I have, uh, I have three people that I really credit. Uh, one of them is a boyhood friend in my village. You know that I grew up in this little African village, the, the only white kid for like 100 miles in every direction. But there was there was a guy named Alésier who was a couple, two, three years older than I am, uh, who really interpreted the African culture to me. He taught me how to hunt. He taught me how to fish. Uh, you know, by the time I was 15 years old and left that village, I was a full trained peasant farmer. And I owed it to him who taught me the African heart of love and joy and hope and peace and generosity and courage. And I just, I just walked in his footsteps until I was 15 years old, came out basically African, except for the color of my skin. Yeah. When I think back on my heart, uh, I owe that young man, most of who I, I used to tell people, everything I need to know to lead Compassion's worldwide ministry, I learned from the poor in a tiny little African village. 
and Alasia was my guide. The second one I owe is my father. My father was a remarkable missionary. He was a civil engineer. You know, we built the first cement block house in West Africa. Uh, we dug wells together. My dad had the incredible ability to make a little five and six year old feel like he couldn't do what he did uh, without my help. So I don't know how much help a five year old is when you're trying to build a little cement block house with a tin roof. Uh, but my dad stopped and asked my advice about this and that and the other thing. One of my earliest memories was when we dug our well. It was about a four foot across hole in the ground out there in the Sahara Desert. And we had to lower the workers down on a pulley down to the very bottom to dig, you know, a few inches every day. And my father seeing that I wanted to do that, I remember him letting me go down on that straddling that bucket on that pulley all the way down. I remember looking up and seeing my father's face way at the top of this. It looked like the sky was the size of a dime. But I was down there and I was digging for water just like everybody else. I remember they pulled me up and I felt like such a man. My father really made me feel like, and we opened up villages to the gospel together. I walked hand in hand with my father into places where no white people had been since the slave traders. So he, uh, he, he helped me understand the importance of missions. He used to tell me, Wes, if God calls you to be a pastor, don't stoop to be a king. So he shaped uh, my, my youth right up until, uh, you know, I was often heading off to college than others. The, the third one that I credit was Wally Erickson, my predecessor at Compassion. He was Compassion's president for 18 years he spotted me when I was only 27 years old working in Haiti, 17 years before his retirement as his successor. And he came back and he told his wife, he had spent a week with me traveling around Haiti, talking about the poor, talking about comp compassion. And he came home and said, honey, I have found my successor. And uh, he didn't tell me or I would have screamed and run the opposite <laughs> direction. I never aspired to lead. I didn't have a big enough ego, if you will, to lead. Uh, but he orchestrated my path. You know, he sent me off for my PhD. He brought me in to be his personal assistant. I sat at the board table thinking my role was to take notes. No, it was to experience the board culture. Afterwards, we'd sit for four hours and he'd say, you see what this guy said and what that guy said? You see how we Now, Wes, remember this, never surprise your board. Always bring them in ahead of time on, on, on big things like that. He took me on major donor calls and taught me how to respect people way beyond what they could give to you financially, but love them, know that they have needs themselves. I didn't know what he was doing, but he was preparing me to be compassion's president. And he never, and he gave me greater and greater responsibilities until with three years to go, I was basically the executive vice president running the whole thing while he was moving rapidly toward retirement. I, I it's uh, thank you for sharing all of that. I'm learning from you, even as you tell those stories. Now, one mm -hmm. of the things that has amazed me, Wes, is I've traveled with you to different countries with compassion and all those employees around the world and anyone that's traveled to meet their compassion child will say this, the DNA of compassion is in every location around the world. It's crazy. <laughs> I was always amazed how they, they understood the vision, they understood the mission, they understood the values, and that's part of your pouring into all of those leaders. But how do you do that with such a large organization, or is it just a small handful that you have to do? What, how, do how are you doing that? Well, you know, it started off with just uh, leading meetings of the 30 of us <laughs> in Chicago. As the organization got bigger and bigger, you had to pour into people and ask hope that they would pour into other people. But, you know, when you're working among the poor, there's no end of things that need to be done. And it's easy to get distracted and you become like an inch deep swamp unless you put banks on or on the river that allow it to go forward so when you're working among the poor you got to know what success is and you got to know what the pathway to success is and um because if you're passionate about helping the poor and you say yes to every opportunity every bright idea every new thing the next thing you know you don't know what you're doing 
So one of the things we did at Compassion is says we can't be everything to everybody. So let's figure out who we are, therefore, who we aren't. And that allowed us across the world. We know that it's about eradicating poverty in Jesus' name. We know that the most strategic and loving focus that can be there is little children who are the poorest of the poor and the ones affected most by poverty, but the hope for the future. We learned from that that if you're going to do that, it's probably something called discipleship. Jesus said, you know, teach them to observe all things I've commanded you, and all things I've commanded you has everything to do with what keeps people poor, the environment, health, education, social strength, economics, all of that is taught in the scriptures. I mean, literally, if you want to learn how to dig a latrine, Leviticus will teach you how to dig a latrine. It's all in the scriptures. And when we came to that moment, Greg, and I remember the very meeting it was, we said, you know what, when everything is said and done, the thing that, that joins all this together is we are discipling children. And we said, if that's the case, who was given that task? That was given to the church. And I remember the meeting where we had where we said, okay, let's stop with supporting other nonprofit organizations. Let's stop supporting even something as strategic and precious as orphanages. Let us invest in the local church. Let us help them do the discipleship task that God has called them to do. And let us try to be invisible in the midst of this. If anybody is going to get thanked, we want it to be that local pastor. And so the program goes on today in 8,600 churches across 25 countries. And you never see compassion on the vehicle. We don't walk in there with compassion t-shirts. We want the people of the community eventually to come to that pastor and say, what is it about you Christians? You know, the Muslims don't care like this. Buddhists don't. Hindus don't. There's something about you and your relationship to God that makes you care about people like us. What is it? And, you know, St. Francis of Assisi, he said, preach the gospel everywhere you go, and if necessary, use words. And what we've done all across the world now for 70 years is equip churches to live out their faith in practical actions in their community, wait for the invitation to speak and use words. And we have watched churches, you know, triple in size in, in just over a few years uh, so, Wes, the, this is, I, I, I want to, I, I don't want to leave this because, there, I, and pass this over for all of our leaders listening, whether it's business or church, wherever you're leading. The two things I'm hearing there about keeping that vision, mission, and values white hot is, number one, you had it very clear. You knew what you were about, what you were saying yes and no to. I, I love that analogy. We're putting banks on the river so the river keeps flowing. So that yep. was crystal clear. You gave that thought. You gave that work. And then secondly, you literally, you lived it. Um, you were pouring into those 30 in Chicago. Then when you would travel, you were pouring into people and rubbing shit. And they saw you living that out and, and then clarifying, here's what those banks look like. So I think that's really important when we think about keeping vision, mission, values white hot is are you as a leader living that out? And secondly, are you able to communicate it in a very clear and concise way? Yep. Okay. And Three we, questions. I, I yeah. can talk with you. Yeah, go ahead, please. Let's keep going. No, no. I was just going to say, uh, sooner or later, you got to have a little bit of a framework around who are you and who aren't you. And that's where we came up with our 12 spiritual leadership principles. And we did artwork so that it showed up on the office walls of every single uh, office around the world. And we tell, taught our leaders in a cascade down from the president, me too, too far out, with uh, each, so each one could give a talk on each one of those principles in the context of their own language, their own culture, their own staff. So everybody was giving the same message of who are we and who aren't we? Uh, how do you recognize the culture of compassion? Uh, and, and ultimately, what, what does success look like? And so, uh, you know, eventually we got access to the internet. Eventually we could do like we did for the last year, Zoom calls where we actually pulled everybody together. But in the process along the way, we had to do exactly what I think Jesus did. And that was, let me pour into these 12 guys, these 12 key messages and let them now go out and pass it on to others. Freely you've received, so now freely give. Okay, Wes, three questions we're asking every podcast guest to, as we wrap up. What do you wish oh, yeah. pastors would do more of? 
Uh, let me just say, first of all, uh, I have a huge respect for pastors, as you know, Greg. The prayer in my heart from the time I was a little boy was, God, please call me to be a pastor. And I went to Moody Bible Institute. I took notes. I was waiting, waiting, waiting for that whisper. I went to Biola University, again, waiting for that. Went to Wheaton College, waiting for that. Finally felt, he's not calling me to be a pastor. So I moved on in my calling to the poor and to discipling children, only to discover in the context of compassion, no, nope, he never intended to call me to be a pastor, but he called me to be a servant to pastors. And that is my greatest joy, both in the USA side, like I did with you, and now all across these countries, over 8,000 churches. So let me just say, first of all, I have a huge respect for the job, and I know there's nothing more important and nothing more strategic. So here's the three things that I would say. Number one, what do I wish they would do more? I wish they would like you, Greg. I wish they would catch the vision that children are the heart and soul of their church, not just someday, but today. I, 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 I long for churches that are alive and just bubbling uh, with church ministry, where every child walking through that church knows that every grown-up cares about them, will listen to them, will stop and pray with them. I picture these kind of churches, and I wish we did more of that. Where I see it happen, it's incredibly exciting. And secondly, what do you wish pastors would do less of? I wish they would lighten up on numbers. I watch them just beat themselves up over how much, how big is the budget, how many people are attending. Uh, they can, when they get together, they do comparisons of these things. I know their denominations just ride herd on them over these things. And I wish we could grasp that, again, enough ultimately is enough. Growth of the church, growth of the budget is a byproduct of doing dynamic evangelism and dynamic discipleship. And all of the techniques and the kinds of music and the kinds of audiovisual, all of the stuff that pits pastor against pastor, even in the town, I wish I could just lift the burden off their shoulders and help them understand. God doesn't call you to huge. He calls you to faithful. And if you are faithful, yes, growth comes, but it's not an end in itself. It's a byproduct of being a pastor. Question three. What's been one thing a pastor has done that's been especially helpful to you personally? Well, there's a couple of them that touched me really, really uh, passionately. I, I was, I, you know, 45 years now, I've poured myself through the church into children in poverty. And one of the most precious things that ever happened to me was in a church in Bolivia. The pastor knew me. He knew what I had done. And before we arrived at that church for our visit, he had taught the children a song that he thought would be meaningful to me. And he called me to the front and he surrounded me with all of these little children. And he said, let's, let's sing for our brother. And I heard these children sing, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. And I just wept like a little baby. I thought, you know what? I don't think I've ever been closer to heaven than the voices of the very children I've poured myself into, children who have been rescued from poverty, now under singing it to let me know that they understand the big picture, what we're trying to achieve. And I'll never forget that minute. That was after 43 years of ministry among children. And they had, you know, they had little signs they held up and they put a sash and a crown on my head. Oh my. And I thought this pastor understands leaders and sacrifice. The other one, uh, Greg, you may think I'm brown nosing, but it's, uh, it's you. Uh, the fact that you read too small to ignore with the heart that I had been praying daily as I wrote that, please, Lord, let this speak to the heart of pastors who have the capacity to really push this forward, but maybe a lot of it is new information to them. And so without, without even knowing your name, I breathed over that, that manuscript. Uh, and when you came along, you read it, you came to meet me. Uh, you transformed your church back at, at River Tree. You joined Stadia. You came up with a slogan for Stadia until every child has a church. You invited me uh, to be the chaplain to Stadia's board. You invited me now into your life. 
uh, as I look that over, uh, I would say of all the pastors I know, uh, the one who knows me best and the one who gave me uh, the greatest gift uh, is you, my friend. Wes Stafford, thank you for speaking into me personally and into the lives of so many today. Grateful. It's my great joy. And uh, Greg, thank you for letting God use you uh, so lovingly, so powerfully for so many people for so long.